Hey you guys, welcome back to Tomes of Terror. So Nick Cutter, this is an author that I've talked about before. Uh, Nick Cutter is actually not his real name. It's actually his horror focused pseudonym. Uh, his real name, he's a Canadian writer uh, named Craig Davidson. I think he mostly writes uh, mainstream fiction or literary fiction uh, under his real name. And then he has a couple of other pseudonyms that he writes different genres under, Nick Cutter being his horror pseudonym. Now, he actually made a big splash uh, in the horror community back in 2014 with his excellent uh, and unbelievably gruesome novel, The Troop, which I actually have reviewed on this series. Uh, it was about like a very small group of uh, Boy Scouts who were trapped on an island who have to contend with one of their number who is like a sociopath uh, and also have to contend with lots and lots and lots of very, very disgusting killer tapeworms. Lots and lots and lots of worms. It's It was revolting and it was also like pretty great. Then in 2015, uh, he unleashed another slab of like super grisly horror uh, called The Deep. Now this was recommended to me by uh, a listener of the show. And when I looked it up on Kindle Unlimited, it was available to read for free. So I dug right into it because I liked the troupe very much. And I have to say, holy tap dancing Christ. <laughs> This is one of the most horrifying things I think I've ever read. Seriously, the whole vibe of this thing really, like, stressed me the fuck out. Um, and I probably think that scenes from it are just going to be kind of rattling around my brain for the rest of my life, probably. I mean, there's this is, like, some pretty fucked up shit. I mean, the troop was fantastic, but this thing was on a whole other level. And I'm going to say this one got me good, probably because there are very few things on Earth that scare me more than thinking about the shit that's w going on like way, way, way down at the bottom of the ocean. Like, no fucking thank you. I don't want anything to do with any of that nonsense. Now, I do have a couple of like caveats before we get too far into it. I'm not gonna lie, this novel homages a lot of other books and movies. And I did see, like this got mostly good reviews, but people that didn't like it, I guess maybe they thought that it was like too much of a ripoff. I don't know if I'd go that far, but, or the, I kind of felt like maybe, maybe they thought it was like just a cut and paste collage of its very, very obvious influences. Now I'm gonna say that I didn't really feel that way at all. Um, I mean, in fiction, everything's been done, you know what I mean? So you, you just kind of have to do variations on a theme. I could totally see though, like how some readers might think it's too similar to other works, but I didn't feel that personally, but I can understand and how people could. Now the blurb on the back of the book um, calls it The Abyss Meets The Shining, which is fairly accurate, but this book, The Deep, also has like substantial dollops of several other things, uh, most notably Event Horizon, uh, Sphere, The Thing, Alien, Hellraiser, Annihilation, uh, Stephen King's It, there was quite a bit of that in there, and also had kind of like a healthy helping of Lovecraftian horror, like thrown in there, like just for funsies. So if the family resemblance to those other books and movies is going to piss you off or is going to, you know, encroach on your enjoyment of it, then maybe skip it. But to be honest with you, I thought you know, in my opinion, that Nick Cutter did a great job just taking elements from all of those stories and combining them into like this really nightmarish creation that was, you know, uniquely his own. The only other possibly slightly negative things I can say about it, um, I'm not real sure how I felt about the ending, uh, which I won't spoil, but if you read it, you probably know what I'm talking about. It's like, I, I could have take, taken it or left it. It's just like, I didn't feel one way or the other about it. Also, there's kind of a thing where there's a really big plot point that takes up a large portion, not only the book's description, um, but also like a lot of the first act. But then as the story goes on, it's almost kind of like you forget, like it doesn't really have any bearing on the actual story, really. And I wasn't, I don't know, that didn't really bother me that much and I'll get into why later on. 
I'll also note that the transitions between like the present day action and the flashbacks, which are numerous, it's kind of like, cause it's kind of a thing where somebody's in a situation where they keep, where they keep uh, being triggered to like remember things from their past. So it goes back and forth, like, you know, to the dude's childhood and all this other kind of stuff. Um, so the transitions were a little bit clunky in places I felt like, but that's, I mean, that's a pretty minor criticism. It didn't really bother me all that much. Like I said, other than that, like I really enjoyed it quite a bit. Now I'm I'm going to warn everyone right out of the gate, animal lovers, uh, that the poor dogs in this, whew, now they don't, they die, but they don't just die. They go out in a way that is so fucking horrible that I could barely stand to read it and it actually like made me cry. So I guess, I mean, in terms of like a horror novel, that's not really a negative in a horror novel because it goes to show that the author effectively conveyed horror. So good for you, I guess. I was just kind of like, God damn it. Oh my God, that bothered me so much. So yeah, if you're real sensitive to like really bad shit happening to animals, this is this is pretty terrible. <laughs> it's pretty terrible. Like the whole time I was hoping that it was that something was gonna like it was gonna be okay that I was just gonna like oh no 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 and it just like got worse and worse and I was just like I am not all right like after reading that yeah okay so now that we've gotten that out of the way uh anyway the deep starts by establishing that the human race is being slowly but kind of also sort of mellowly like low-key being phased out by a weird pandemic which is known as the gets uh which is short for forgets no one knows exactly how the disease works or how it spreads even, but basically if you get it, you develop these, you start developing these weird spots like on your arms. I think it's just on your arms, like around your elbows, like kind of like, um, like on a banana skin, like that kind of thing. And then you start forgetting things like just little shit at first, like, oh, where are those keys and shit like that. But eventually, like as it goes on, your body forgets how to eat and then forgets how to breathe. And then like from that point, obviously you die. Now this plot point, incidentally, is the one that I was talking about that's kind of like set up in the beginning and that becomes like less and less important as the story unfolds to the point where you as the reader, and I mean I as the reader, almost kind of forget that the whole worldwide plague deal is like going on is a thing. Now this actually didn't really concern me all that much uh, for two reasons. One, the stuff that was happening like in the main part of the story, like to the main characters, was way more interesting and way more fucked up than the plague subplot, I guess I can call it. And two, I feel like we didn't really need yet another book that's all about, oh, the human race like slowly dying off anyway. So I'm like, I was kind of glad that that, that, that didn't really factor into the main part of the story like all that much. So our main protagonist is a veterinarian by the name of Dr. Luke Nelson. Now he has lost his, his wife has divorced him, like his wife, Abby, but I think she also like later on like died from the gets. Now, seven years prior, and this kind of like comes back into the story later on, but seven years prior, the couple's five-year-old son, I think he's five or six, uh, their son, Zachary, mysteriously disappeared from a nearby park when Luke took the boy out there after school. Like they're playing like hide and seek and he literally like turned away for like 20 seconds and the boy like literally disappeared. And they have had like found absolutely no trace of him like since then. And obviously he's really, really fucked up about it. And like, and he feels responsible. His wife felt he was responsible, all this other kind of stuff, even though it was just like a crazy, like I said, he looked away for literally 20 seconds and the kid disappeared. So that's kind of like a little bit of the backstory. So at the beginning of the book, Luke is actually being flown out to a research station that's way out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, uh, specifically right over the deepest part of the Mariana Trench. Turns out that eight miles beneath the sea, a bizarre substance that they call ambrosia has been discovered. And this stuff may have the potential not only to cure the gets like the you know because there's still like a lot of people left on earth like not everybody you know it's it's not like a situation where because like shit's still like halfway functioning you know what i mean so it might not only cure that but it actually might cure every other disease that's like ever afflicted the human species since the dawn of mankind right now luke's extraordinarily intelligent like super super genius uh but also like cold sociopathic asshole of a brother whose name is Clayton. 
he's one of the world's preeminent scientists, and he's actually working down at the ocean floor along with a couple of other researchers, and they're experimenting with this ambrosia stuff in the hopes that eventually they can make it into, like, a universal healer because it doesn't just, like, cure disease, but it also, like, cures wounds, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like this miracle stuff. So it's kind of established that several of the, uh, you know, Earth's governments, like different countries' governments, like they all collaborated and they built this thing, uh, like a research station way underneath, like in the Mariana Trench called the Trieste. Uh, and this facility is eight miles underneath the Pacific and they're, that, cause that's where the ambrosia was found. And so they're trying to like harvest it and isolate it and like figure out what it can do and how they can use it and stuff like that. So Luke is actually being shuttled down to the Trieste because of this really weird audio message that um, the above water like uh, research station got. So the audio message was asking for him and the message was ostensibly from his brother Clayton. Also, the scientists down at the research lab have gone pretty much radio silence. There's just kind of like they can't see them on the monitors anymore and they're not communicating with the surface anymore. And so nobody like nobody on the surface really knows what the fuck is going on down there. Um, also, shortly before Luke arrived, uh, one of the researchers his name was Dr. Westlake. He actually came up in one of the like little pod things that they have to go like to shuttle people up and down. He came out of there and they opened it up and he was dead in there and it looked like he had basically like cut himself to pieces like multiple times. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was like there was all these cuts and then they'd like kind of partially healed over and then he'd go like, cut, like it, he'd been going like doing it for a really long time and they're just like, huh, that's really weird. And like when he gets to the top, it's like it doesn't even look like a human being anymore. It just looked like a fucking, yeah, it, it was like a monstrosity. Now Luke has actually no idea why his brother Clayton would have asked for him. He's like, you know, uh, the, the brothers haven't spoken in years. They really don't get along. And Clayton has always viewed his brother uh, as well as pretty much everyone else on planet Earth with barely disguised contempt. He's one of those, well, I'm way smarter than you guys. And like I said, he's kind of like a sociopath. Like he doesn't really have any human emotions or anything like that. So Luke is just befuddled as to like, why the fuck would he want me here? I haven't talked to him in forever and he doesn't need me for anything. So I don't really know why. But Luke has to admit that he's curious not only about Clayton's reasons for summoning him there, like eight miles underneath the ocean, but also about this supposedly miraculous substance that he's been working working with that may like end up saving the world. Because like I said, he m lost um, you know family members to the Gets as well. So he's like, oh my God, this could be like some big miracle because they're gonna cure all the diseases. So Luke, uh, accompanied by uh, one of the people that works at the, you know, the, the upper research facility, uh, who is U.S. Navy Lieutenant Commander Alice Al Sykes, uh, who's a great character, actually. They kind of go in, they get in one of the pod things and they descend into this lightless alien depths of the Pacific. And, oh man, if you were at all claustrophobic, then this book is going to trigger you big time. <laughs> Just, I mean, just the thought and like the descriptions of it, the thought of going just down and down and down and like the descent takes like eight or nine hours or something like that, you know, and just going down into this utter blackness that's like super pressurized. So it's like just like pushing all like all the weight and everything like that. I mean, that is just on its own is like really pants shittingly scary. But then Nick Cutter like layers anxiety upon anxiety and he introduces essentially what you first think is maybe like escalating madness into the whole equation so you don't even have just this hey we're eight miles underneath the earth uh kind of thing but there's also like all this other crazy shit going on so once luke gets down there and gets to the trieste the state the station he starts to notice that all of these terrifying childhood memories and nightmares and stuff like that are like coming back and they're like way more vivid than ever. And he's like starting to see things and hear things and all this other kind of stuff. And at first there's no way of knowing whether his sort of crumbling hold on rationality is caused by, you know, maybe he has the gets, like maybe he has this plague that's making him forget things or like that his mind is winging out. Or it could be 
um, just the experience of being in this like intensely isolated environment, this confined facility that could literally collapse from the immense pressure like any second. Like, yeah, it's made of all these high tech polymers and stuff, but you know, if somebody goes and punches a hole in the wall or like the glass breaks or something like that, the whole thing would just be like crushed and you wouldn't even know like what hit you. So, you know, yeah, it could be that. Like I said, very much an isolating, horrible experience that could cause you to go crazy too. Or could it be perhaps something to do with the very substance that all these scientists were put here to study? Like, is this ambrosia alive and worse is it sentient is it malevolent like what exactly is this shit and what is it doing to the minds of the people that are down there uh studying it you know what i mean so so yeah this book was nerve-wracking as all get out and it really i mean the way that it's written really made me feel kind of every stifling second of being trapped in this big fucking tin can beneath billions of pounds of just this black merciless water just like crushing down on you while at the same time some apparently alien uh, organism of some kind is it's not alien literally like it's not from outer space so i don't want to give that impression but i just meant alien as in strange like we don't know anything about it so this organism is like rooting through your psyche like looking for the most ghastly things to show you to just make you go like completely gibberingly insane because it can get inside your head and it knows like what it knows what to do and what to show you to get like the maximum impact you know what i mean like it knows what your fears are and it plays on those so like i said kind of like stephen king's it in that way uh, this book is also intensely, intensely gross. Um, lots and lots of gooey body horror, uh, you know, and lots like big millipedes and maggots and just fucking shit like the thing where it's like, you know, stuff coming out of people's heads and it's, it's crazy. Like, it's crazy. Uh, so it's definitely not for the squeamish. Probably you don't want to be eating when you're reading it either because it's pretty fucking gross. So, I mean, if you're a fan of any of the books and movies that I previously mentioned, and you don't mind a story that kind of takes bits and pieces from all of those, like a, you know, bit like a magpie, and kind of wraps them all up in a sickening new skin, I guess, then this should be, you know, right up your alley or down your trench, I guess, <laughs> like, as it were. That sounded kind of dirty. But yeah, um, honestly, as great as the troop was, I think I liked this one more. I definitely felt like this one was a lot scarier. And like I said, that's probably because I'm like, fucking terrified of deep water and even if it had just been about a guy like down in this depths and like nothing even you know nothing nothing more than that was going on it would still be really scary but then the fact that he's down there trapped with these people who are maybe going crazy or maybe being affected by this substance maybe like whatever it is and shit like that so yeah this was like pretty fucking terrifying uh i'm still mad about the dogs but you know what are you gonna do it's a horror story and uh, I don't know. No one's going to leave the puppies alone, I guess. But yeah, this, <laughs> the dogs in this had like one of the worst fates of like any animal and like anything that I can remember. So I'm just like warning you about that going in. But other than that, I mean, I had a blast with this one, I guess, even though it kind of stressed me the fuck out and made me like really, really, I don't know. It just, it made me kind of like, uh, but then I couldn't stop reading it at the same time. You know what I mean? Like it was like watching a slow motion car crash, I guess. It was kind of like that. But yeah, I really, really liked it a lot. So if you have Kindle Unlimited, you can actually read it for free. Uh, and if you've read it, let me know what you think about it. And I've read The Troop and I've read this one now and I know Nick Cutter has like a few other books as well. So if anybody wants to recommend any of those, it would be a while like before I got to it because I like to kind of spread the authors out and everything. But let me know if any of the other ones are, are really good or worth reading and maybe I'll review one of those in the future. And that will do it for this Tomes of Terror. I will see you guys on the next one. Bye.